Bob, Bob, Bob is going far. All right, this is for real. Yes. Hey, I'm Francine. When Bob graduated from high school, he got a job in the plant where his dad has been working for years. Bob worked hard, and promotion followed promotion. Until last week, he was made assistant plant manager. Bob has gone far. Bob, Bob, Bob has gone far. Right, Bob? Uh, meeting some artists who work and live in New York, and that's not easy. Tough town. And um, talking to them, trying to find out what they do and why they do it here. Art world, and I'd like for you to come uh, and join me on this journey, this visit, this, this adventure. I do not want to work in 55th Park Avenue in a cubicle being told what to do. Portable, affordable art. I can tell you, in the arts, look, we all need art. You can't leave New York. <laughs> okay. The next downtown local six train to Brooklyn Bridge City Hall will arrive in two minutes. Down under the Manhattan Bridge overpass, or Dumbo, if you don't want to sound dumb, has become one of New York's premier art districts. There, we met up with the artist Ken Solomon. I guess like, I'm just really curious, like, this is the mecca of, of, of artist haven. Right. And it's also uh, extremely competitive. Does right. it ever occur to you to want to like you know do do your work somewhere else? Why stay here? Uh, yeah, I think I I like that competitiveness. I like that it's you know beats your work. And not even the competitiveness, but like the fact that it is the haven of it all. So it's like inspiring. I'm going to meet artists. I'm going to meet collectors. I'm going to meet people who are involved in the art world. And for a long time as well, that was a pretty intimidating place mm -hmm. so to have grown more and more comfortable with it mm -hmm. and feel a part of it is you know pretty exciting oh well, I moved to New York because I got a job working for the National Football League Creative Services Department oh, wow. and I thought to myself wow art and sports I mean what an amazing merging and um, I hated it which is <laughs> which is awesome because I think sometimes figuring out what it is that you want to do is mm -hmm process of elimination, it's like, I do not want to work in 55th and Park Avenue in a cubicle being told what to do. But anyway, Please so continue. when I, I, I started, you know, realizing, like, I want to be an artist, and, and my influences were, like, 19th century European painters. So, you know, it was like Van Gogh, um, it was, uh, Less Seurat, you know, it was like the passionate, gestural, yeah. um, who was Van Gogh's guy who painted um, bright colors, not very nice guy? Van Gogh's color guy? Go again. Right, so I, I, I kind of thought, so okay, I want to be an artist, and so that means it's not just the practice of painting, but it also means behaving like an artist, and my influences were those guys, so I thought I had to be... Um, a real curmudgeon, an asshole. Can I say asshole? <laughs> so, <laughs> beep. Cur curmudgeon, right? I thought I had to be miserable. I thought I had to be lonely. I thought I had to be despondent. I thought I had to, you know, hate people. Um, and so I was like, you know, whatever it takes to be an artist, I'll do that. So I started painting like in this very gestural, uh, figurative way of like isolated strangers in New York. And and you know tried to find absinthe so I could drink as much as I could because I was gonna be Paul Gauguin. I knew to be an artist you have to be very serious about your work, but that doesn't mean that the work has to be serious. I and that was that. big for me because it's like you know what I'm more playful than I am angry. I love that. And then that opened up a lot for me. So I'm working on Google. Um, and then, again, it's like, okay, wh wh where can I steer from here, right? Um, and it brought me to, you know, then I started looking at my phone. 
And then, you know, when I walk around the street and I'm thinking, you know, do I want to be painting my phone? Is the phone relevant? And, you know, you get on a train, it's like, everyone's on their phone. It's like, yeah, the phone is rather relevant. Um, but I, I think his ideas um, of like using imagery that exists already is brilliant. Yeah. Because it's, you know, the same thing as using, a, again, to Van Gogh, it's like, you know, he could paint a tree that existed. So, so you know, I, I think I think it is, there's like a real genius to just, just taking other people's imagery and sort of curating it to suit your vision. Like, I don't love social media, and I, a lot of the things I paint, it's not like I love the, um, like, the vehicle behind it, but I love the, the... You know, I know that it's extremely prevalent. And powerful? And really? Sure, and there's, Absolutely. you know, it's information. So a lot of the things I deal with are information, but it's not, not like I love right. the internet. Right, right, right. I mean, I think it's cool. I don't, I don't not like it. But it's more like a, ref, a reference or a resource right. than like an inspiration. I mean, it's certainly, um, I think the inspiration comes outside of it, and then I go to it. Right, like I want it to just kind of be a reflection of me, and I think I'm unique. I think you're unique. Exactly. I think we're all very unique, but I think the uh, the goal is to kind of represent yourself. Greenpoint is a Brooklyn neighborhood that has had some notable residents over the years, such as the actress Mae West and bank robber Willie Sutton. One current notable resident is artist Danielle Charette. Danielle is a painter who shared her storytelling oil paintings with us when she invited us to her studio. When I see people, they're pointing and laughing at some really obscure dark humor I might have put in a piece, or um, I have a lot of people who break down and cry at my paintings, and that's the moment I know like that my language is reaching people. Um, I've, I've been painting since I was a child through um, schooling, my primary schooling, which I did back in Pennsylvania. Uh, and I have family in both places, Pennsylvania and here in New York. Yeah, you can't, you can't leave New York. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, it's really tough to live here, so why yeah. not? Yeah. Why can't you? What draws you? <laughs> uh, I don't know what it is. There's a part of me that has um, uh, the country in me, I believe, from my upbringing there and spending quite a few years there. Um, but I can never get the city out of me. Um, and I think for me it's a, a visual stimulation, yeah. a constant visual stimulation here in the city. And I find that um, with my art, um, and being a creative, I need constant stimulation. Um, my work is highly um, metaphoric and symbolic. Um, I use a lot of um, my own sort of um, iconic graphic symbols and symbolism uh, within them. It's a funny question people ask the artists. They always say, well, how long did that take? And it's always been a weird question to me because <laughs> um, for me especially, it's something I can't really answer. Because when I'm working on a series, uh, I work on many, many pieces at the same time. Sometimes uh, I had a series that I had 25 works all started at the same time. Um, so I can never tell somebody how long something takes, because uh, I do tend to work on multiple pieces at the same time. Dead men talk too much. Text, text, a bastard born of polyphonic sorcery. Self absorbed polymath. These black clouds follow me. I know I'm not sorry. The cause of mind is a terrible thing to taste. Like skyscraper, villain caper, like my control telemetry. Bump these fractal tapes and peep our panther modern poetry. Over in Bayrich, I met up with Jenna Morello. Jenna is a street artist, mixed media artist, and she can take anything and make it beautiful. The color, like the 
like a spray can. Like spray cans have really cool names. They all have like really, really. You mean the, the colors? The colors. Yeah. The colors of spray cans are really cool. So there's like, say, like a green will be a mist. They have whale for a blue. Like they have all across the board. So just to remember, I started calling, you know, various pieces. The name of the the name of the uh, that's on the spray can. Are you a graffiti artist? No, no, I'm not a graffiti artist. I'm not. I'm not based around letters. I don't. You know, some people that's their whole career, their whole life, and it's a it's an art form that people take a lot of time. But you you, you paint in, in, in huge uh, uh, surfaces and, and, and murals. And I do. I guess it would fall more under the street art category. Person, I mean, graffiti. Yeah, is letters. It's you know, it started out as letters and tags and throwies and all that it's not a world that i just ever got into i would have loved to it's just you know letters was never something that i ended up getting into street art was ne it wasn't my intention yeah street art was never my intention i ended i just kind of ended up painting i ended up wandering outside to to paint other other the theme of this show, body of work show. um yeah. yeah it's not even so much that i like hearts because I mean, the one way or the other. With this body of work, just turned out because it's, it, this body of work is a personal one. Basically, um, these were all the accumulation over the course of the last three years. It's just that they're all about the same relationship, honestly. So it's just a bit of a tumultuous relationship. So I guess the way that people write songs, mm -hmm. you know what I mean, to kind of vent and sort things out, as opposed to other things. I, I think I paint the same way. So Initially, they were never meant to be seen. Initially, like, I just would paint, you know, we would fight, and then I would paint, you know, I would go paint because I would just be so frustrated, and I think if I put a visual to whoever I was feeling, it kind of allowed me to move past it and move on, so. Yeah, yeah. Influences from my life subconsciously have surfaced, you know, whether family or friends or all, I, that seems to come out in things that I make. Like when I was younger, my parents were big antiquers and nothing made me crazier. Like I didn't want to go antiquing, I wanted nothing to do with it. But now that I'm older, you know, and I, I see things like that and I'll paint on things like that and whatnot, so I don't know if influences like that have been ingrained in me. So yeah. that's why I do what I do or yeah. I just like antiques and stuff like that better. It's, like the best way I could describe it, you know, you have a dream, and then your dream just kind of is all these random I don't know, assortment of thoughts and stuff that just yeah, kind of... patterns of randomness. And then, uh, and then you dream and they just kind of, you know, sporadically filter out your day, whatever that happened. My brain kind of works the same way. Like, I'll see something and it'll store somewhere, I don't even know, and then something else will re-spark that. And I also can't help but notice these amazing masks, like, yeah, studded yeah. masks. They all have such great, strong personality. I don't know. Um, yeah, I go through phases, like I can't make one of something, so I'll make things in sets. So this was, I don't even remember what year this was, just maybe three, four years ago. They're all actual gas masks, I think I got them at like an Army and Navy store on Cape Cod. Did you, did you, I thought you, you went up like one of them when you were painting, and then after no, you painting, I'm going to no, just do that something. one I would wear if I was that painting, because that's a respirator, wrong. but no, this is a full, this is like a World War II full gas mask. Wow. So it's, kind of tight on the face, and this thing is the thing that you pull and it releases, I think, oxygen or something. But no, these were all, uh, yeah, these were a series that I ended up doing. I mean, they came out cool. They came out really cool. I Back in Dumbo, my crew and I visited Mark Dennis. Mark's studio is what you would imagine a New York artist's studio to be. It's huge, full of light, and it's in the heart of a mega art scene. And, and passion to me is pretty much everything. Intensity and passion are like the two main ingredients for a good life. And whether you screw up, whether you succeed, you live very fully. And I, I strive to live every day fully. And I'm very passionate and intense about a lot of things. Listen, I, I mean, so, so why, why did you make that decision to move to New York? I'm really interested because, listen, I think it, it is, it's obvious to everyone in the world that you know, New York is the art mecca, global art mecca, but yet also it's extremely expensive town to live in and extremely competitive. 
why 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 do it here? I mean there's other places too. Why yeah, you know? so I'm of the mind. So I came to New York because one, I was driven to come here. But my goal all the way through my training was to eventually wind up in New York, you know, for career purposes. My motive was to see good art and to make money. And to eat. So this is the food. So this is a dream that yeah. you have always had. It was a dream. Yeah. I'm, 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 living, I'm living my dream. Yeah. yeah. So, 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 so getting back to the notion that people should come to New York as a stepping stone, listen, if you can afford it, you can, if it can be facilitated and you've got some support and you can handle it, it's a rat race here, it's freaking wild, the energy is crazy and my energy needs to be matched. I was, I needed to be in, I needed to be in the most energized city that was focused, with it. I could focus on the arts and whatnot, and New York is it for me. So eight years ago, sort of what kind of launched my career was these paintings of still lifes in a contemporary setting taken from ideas of art historical still lifes. Large carcasses, you know, based on Rembrandt's flayed arms. Uh, and then I shifted into what you, into like the oak painting, the voyeuristic idea of people watching and looking at art my relationship to the art and their relationship to the art and pop, well, pop culture and art history intersect. And then I sort of had this idea. I missed painting that still life. Mm -hmm. And I thought, how can I reinvent this contemporary still life? What is it that the world needs me on? What is it that is drawing me towards it? There's always the floral motif, there's always the flowers. I'd be looking at a painting, a grand painting of Titian in a major museum. I'd be looking at the details, and I love details, and I always notice these little bouquets or small floral motifs, one little rose, one little carnation being held by a woman in a Rembrandt portrait. It wasn't the gaze, it wasn't the eyes, it was that little carnation. And I thought, my God, that's it. I'm going to go, I'm going to go. Headlong, yeah, balls to the wall on these full motifs of how they intersect pop culture, they intersect with life and death. And they, they're all about a celebration of life, but they also have a great mystery. So rather than painting about art history per se and one's relationship to art, I thought I'm going to get back to the most fundamental of things human emotion. So I was going to make paintings about human emotion. Look, we all need art, no matter what community, no matter what town, no matter what city. There's going to be art somewhere in that environment. So be that person to contribute. Because if you're not going to get to New York, you're not going to get to LA, you're not going to go to Houston, Miami, wherever that like, consider the, the neckers might be. Yeah. My God, man, you live once, make it work wherever the hell you are. And visit. There's always a gentle. Big thank you to all the artists in this episode. Thanks for inviting us into their creative world. And stay tuned for the next episode of Pod Matters. Bob has gone far, but he's still planning to go farther. consider an entirely different type. When Bob graduated... I got a letter from the DMV, oh. and I was uh, asked to renew my license. Right. And two years earlier, I went as Bob Ross, a uh, big wig, television artist. Right, okay. <laughs> Happy trees, squirrels coming out of his hair. And I thought to myself, you know, I should, um, I should wear this wig for my license picture. 
Oh my goodness. Which I did, and it's in timeout, which is over there. And that was, and that was years ago. But what, what do I? Do you still have that picture on a license? I mean, on a, on a, on a driver's license? I do. Oh, awesome. <laughs> we can show it. <laughs> we can share that yeah. later. Um, but I realized, like, I wasn't just gonna put it on in the, in the parking lot of the DMV. I was gonna wear it all day, so I could kind of forget it was there and just kind of take on the personification the persona, of this. Yeah. Big wig, and um, I hope it wasn't summer. What's that? <laughs> Keep going. Oh, yeah. I hope it wasn't summer. <laughs> oh, yeah. oh, it was. Oh, yeah, it might have been summer, but that didn't even matter. It should have been summer. All hot and sweaty and afro right, right. So, um, so it was. I, I, I realized this kind of transformation was extremely empowering. Right? It was kind of like I don't really want to be Dennis Rodman. <laughs> But, but I would love to be Dennis Rodman for four hours. Exactly. And then if I could turn the button off, that would be great. So like that's what this week kind of did for me. It's like, hey, listen, I can be more outrageous. And, and you know, I think I sort of, sort of struggle with like being outrageous and being, and, or not. And I think outrageous is fun, but you know, then there's like tact and taste. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So it was really fun. So I told my friends, I said, guys, this wig, like you should wear it out one day. You want to accomplish things. It's like, wear this wig. It is extremely empowering. Mm -hmm. So I put the wig on my friends um, and took a headshot of them, and then I put and then like I put it on my my family, right? I put it on my grandmother, who spent like 90 years just like holding in all like emotions of anger, right? So, okay. oh, she just wow. you know, she didn't get mad, and she put on the wig and she was just like, and I was like, wow, wow. therapy. Wow. So I photographed her, and then I started, and then I ran out of friends, and I ran out of family. 